Hi everyone, this is Hayao Tasaki. In this short video, I'd like to discuss the essence of my new paper with Naoto Shiraishi, my young friend, entitled Nature, of course, a vacuum. Uh, this is not Naoto, the guy who said this. And more precisely, we discuss a simple rigorous example of thermalization in an isolated microscopic quantum system. So what do I mean by thermalization? Here is a typical example. So here's, here is a box. And on, in the left half of the box, you have a gas in equilibrium at temperature T and pressure P. And the right half of the box is a vacuum. Okay. And then you, you remove the wall. Then you get this drastically non-equilibrium state uh, in which this finite pressure part and the zero pressure part coexist. And of course, this is unstable. The gas quickly expands and you reach a uh, new equilibrium state. Okay. This process is called thermalization. By the way, this is Professor Boltzmann. And in this paper, we prove that this process does take place in a dilute ideal gas of fermions on a chain. Uh, this is important, evolving only under quantum mechanical time evolution. So uh, this is the table of content. And let me start from motivation that is very short only one slide. So we are interested in the origin of thermalization. Thermalization means the approach to thermal equilibrium. And our basic question, which is uh, directly related to the foundation of equilibrium statistical mechanics, is whether an isolated macroscopic quantum system thermalizes only by means of quantum mechanical time evolution, uh, this unitary time evolution. Okay, And uh, now, these days, uh, people believe that the answer is yes. And this answer is supported by numerous theoretical arguments, very plausible arguments, uh, very beautiful numerical simulations, and wonderful experiments in cold atoms. OK, but I would say that there are no concrete and realistic examples in which the presence of thermalization was established without relying on any unproven assumptions. OK, so uh, in this paper, we prove the absence of thermalization in some restricted sense for low-density non-interacting fermions on a chain, and without making any assumptions. Okay. okay, so I will quickly tell you the main result of the paper. So this is our model. We consider a system of n non-interacting fermions on the chain, one-dimensional lattice with length L, and uh, for a technical reason, I assume that L is a large prime number, and N is just a particle. This is a particle number. This is a large positive integer, and this is a density. And we consider the region where rho is rather small, low density region. And this is a very standard Hamiltonian for free fermion. So uh, particle fermions can hop. Uh, from a site to its neighbors. And only one thing non-standard is that we do have this phase factor here, okay? And this is needed for this uh, purpose of avoiding degeneracy. So we can prove that the energy eigenvalues of this H, many body Hamiltonian H, is not, are non-degenerate for most values of theta, except for a finite value of theta, uh, this uh, spectrum of anybody system, are free from, is free from degeneracy. That is something we can prove. Uh, actually, I have to assume rho is uh, less than water or something. But anyway, you can prove this. Or more, uh, more concretely, you can, I can just tell you that uh, it's sufficient to choose this very small theta. Okay? And then I guarantee that uh, H has no degeneracy at all. So this is what we do. So suppose that we take this theta, that's enough. And then we pick up, we pick our initial state randomly. So we pick a normalized state phi zero at random with uniform probability from the Hilbert space uh, in which all particles are in the left half chain, okay? So, uh, so that means the right half chain is just empty and vacuum. And in this case, uh, we are considering lattice system. So this corresponds to taking equilibrium state at infinite temperature. And of course, the particles are confined in the half chain. Okay? So this is a very non-equilibrium initial condition, initial state. And then you consider just the standard time evolution by means of this Hamiltonian. And we, uh, we focus on this uh, observable and left, which is the total number of particles in the left half chain. 
Okay. In the initial non-equilibrium state, we had all the particles in the left half chain. So we have this. Okay. This is one. Now here comes the theorem. This is a bit uh, lengthy, but let me let me tell you what it is. So the following tr is true with probability greater than this. But you know, since I want to have make n, I want to fix rho and make n large. So this is very small. So this is almost one. And actually, this is uh, probability is for the choice of phi zero, the initial state. And then there exists sufficiently large t time. And this set G, the subset of Z, the interval zero and between zero and T, and this interval almost, fit, oh no, no, this G, the set G almost fills the whole interval. So this G absolute value is the total length of G. And this ratio G divided by T is again, almost one. So G is almost everywhere, okay? And then for any T from this G, uh, the met, and, Okay, you choose any t from this g, and then you measure this obje observable n left and denote by n left the measurement result. Then I would tell you that with probability very close to one, so this is the uh, quantum mechanical probability. You make you make a quantum mechanical measurement, so this is a quantum mechanical probability with very probability almost uh, almost almost one. Uh, you have this inequality. So this means that this ratio is close to one half. This is a precision, okay? And actually precision is not very small in general, but this is the statement. Uh, but this is what's too formal. So let me, let me rephrase it in a less formal manner. So the theorem basically says that it almost, when n is large, when n is large, it, it almost certainly happens that for sufficiently large and typical time t, the measurement result of n left which I denote by n left, almost certainly satisfies this. So it's almost equal to one, one half. And of course, uh, we started from the non-equilibrium state where this uh, n over n, n, n left over n is one. Uh, this means that we started from non-equilibrium and we reached equilibrium state. So we see thermalization, okay? But I have to admit that uh, this, near equality is valid only with this precision epsilon naught. And this epsilon naught may not be small if rho is not small, okay? So uh, in order to say that we, we do have thermalization result, we have to make rho small enough to have uh, the desired precision. But anyway, if you take rho small enough, we do have rigorous thermalization result without uh, relying on any unproven assumption. Okay, now uh, um, I want to answer some frequently asked questions. So I told you that we have uh, we have chain with whose length is a prime. So that thermalization take place only in the special free fermion chain with a prime L. That's very weird. Uh, but of course, uh, the physics should not change when L is not a prime. But mathematically speaking, this is so far the only example where we can prove thermalization without relying on any unproved assumptions. So this is just a technical prime L is a technical limitation. Okay. And moreover, actually, we do have rather general result. Okay. And we indeed prove a general summarization theorem uh, for lattice gas, low density lattice gas under these two rather plausible assumption. I will talk about this later. And uh, I would say that these are very plausible and we are almost, we are very close to proving both, uh, justifying both for uh, for non, non -interact, no, no, for interacting models, non-integrable models, uh, but, uh, but still for the moment, we can only treat uh, this free fermion case. Okay, another question is about the setting. So we consider a totally isolated system, but but there can't be a completely isolated system. So why do we treat isolated system? Okay, so uh, this is our setting, right? So we this is the quantum system of interest and it's perfectly isolated from the outside world. But if you think about the real physics, this should be the situation. You have quantum system of interest then there is a surrounding environment. It's a larger, quantum system and there always is inter there, there always are interaction between the, the 
uh, quantum system of interest and surrounding environment. And this point was emphasized, for example, in the textbook of Landau Lifshitz. And they say that the subsystem or system of interest is not closed systems. Closed system means isolated system. So they uh, they they emphasize that these the subsystems are quasi-closed. And they say that uh, uh, it can be realized, it can be regarded as a closed, isolated system only for a short time. And moreover, this is a very uh, interesting remark. Moreover, it is just this relatively weak interaction between the system of interest and the environment, which leads finally to the establishment of statistical equilibrium, so thermalization. So actually, this is uh, contrary to what we believe. This is very interesting. But anyway, so we have to answer this kind of question. So there are two answers. So one is fashionable modern answer. We live in 20, the 21st century. And then oh, there are many modern experiments in cold atoms. So they are almost, almost isolated. So we do have motivation for considering isolated systems. Uh, but And this is a less fashionable answer. Well, we wish to learn what isolated system can do, like whether they can thermalize or not. And actually, uh, probably Landau and Lifshitz believed that an isolated system can hardly thermalize. But now people, we believe, and actually we give an example, uh, that an isolated system can thermalize. And anyway, uh, we probably we should first learn all these things. And after that, we may study the effect played by the environment. So that's, these are my answers to these questions. Okay, so in the final part, uh, let me discuss the essence of the proof rather briefly. So I start from basic concepts and strategies. Uh, in this business of thermalization, there are two, there are two uh, important concepts. One is very famous and called the ETH, energy eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And it basically says that all energy eigenstates uh, with close energy eigenvalues are similar with each other. And it was, uh, actually first proposed by von Neumann. He didn't call it ETH, but he first introduced this notion and it was rediscovered later. And the other very important concept, which is less uh, famous is called the effective dimension. Uh, psi J is energy eigenstate and it's defined this way, but in words, uh, the effective counts the effective number of energy eigenstates that constitute the initial state phi zero. And the importance of effective dimension in the business of thermalization was, I think, first pointed out by myself back in 98. Okay, and now uh, we believe that this ETH is valid in most sufficiently complex quantum antibody systems. And also this effective dimension is very, very large. It's almost the same as the whole Hilbert space dimension for realistic non-equilibrium states in sufficiently complex quantum many-body systems. So these are strong beliefs, but we still do not have general proof. And we believe, we think that these, the proofs of these statements are very, very difficult. Okay, anyway, these are two basic concepts. And uh, here are uh, uh, more concrete, uh, strategies for proving the presence of thermalization. And I can roughly classify the strategies into three. The first strategy is to assume a strong, rather strong version of ETH, and it goes back to von Neumann, and it was reformulated in modern language in this paper. And so, yeah, this is one strategy. The, the second strategy, which is I think most common, is to assume a version of ETH, not a very strong one, and also assume a moderately large effective dimension. And actually this kind of strategy was first discussed by myself. Okay? And then, uh, okay, there are later works, more refined works. Okay, and, and there is one more strategy uh, which, in which you only assume that effective dimension is very, very large. But actually, uh, as I said, effective dimension is believed to be large. So this is a plausible assumption. And uh, in this paper, in this paper, we use this third uh, strategy to establish the, thermal, the presence of thermalization. Okay, so let me say, of, uh, let me explain you briefly why does this large effective dimension lead to thermalization? Okay, so uh, this is our initial state, and I expanded it uh, in terms of energy eigenstate. 
And then, then the time above state given by this is of course written like this, some easy quantum mechanics. And then you, uh, you take some observable physical observable and consider the expectation value. Uh, then uh, by using this, uh, the expectation value can be written like this with double sum. And then you consider the long time average of this expectation value, and then you have to integrate this thing. Now you assume that uh, energy eigen values are non-degenerate. This means that uh, this is non-zero uh, when j and k are not, not equal. And then this term, whoops, I forgot i here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I will add. So you have i here, and then this term oscillates, right? And then oscillation, uh, this term will go away. And then uh, we had double sum here, but now this double sum changes into single sum, and this becomes this alpha absolute value squared. So you get something very similar to a statistical mechanical average, okay? So this is just a very general statement, general observation. Now you assume that this effective dimension for some reason was very, very large. It was almost as large as the whole dimension of the whole Hilbert space, okay? This is actually the maximum possible value for the effective. And then in this case, you can easily convince yourself that uh, this roughly means that all this alpha j absolute value squared is similar to d total inverse, okay? And then uh, if you plug this in here, then you find that this long time average is given almost like this. So this is a trace, but you divide it by dimension. So this is the canonical average at infinite temperature. So this tells you that the uh, long time average of this expectation value is given by the canonical distribution. Okay, And then uh, of course you have to work a little bit, but this is the essence of getting uh, thermal Can on a canonical ensemble or you know uh, equilibrium state average starting from uh, quantum mechanical expectation value. And here I discussed the case for infinite temperature, but there is there also is a version for finite temperature. Okay, so uh, let me now tell you the structure of our proof. Okay, and here are uh, notations. H left is the Hilbert space in which all particles are in the half chain, and P left is a projection onto this sub-Hilbert space. And as I said, uh, our we have a general theory, okay? So our, our proof consists of two parts. We have a general theory and analysis of the free fermion chain, okay? In the general theorem, uh, in the general theory part, we prove that a low density lattice gas in general exhibits thermalization under the following two very plausible assumptions. And assumption number one is that energy eigenvalues are non-degenerate, okay? And we believe that sufficiently complex non-integrable quantum system has no degeneracy. So this is very plausible, but it's in general very hard to prove. And assumption number two is again, very uh, plausible. So it says that for any energy eigenstate psi j, uh, this inequality is valid. What is this? Well, this P left is a projection onto H left. So this is nothing but the probability that you find all the particles in the left half of the chain, okay? So it's a very rare event and it's very plausible that it's dump up upper bounded by two to the minus n, okay? So these are, and so if this, if you could prove these two assumptions, justify these two assumptions, then our theory applies, okay? And uh, okay, that's the general theory part. And we also have the analysis of the free fermion chain part. And then uh, we want to justify these two assumptions. Now assumption two is actually easy. We have, we, we treat free fermions, so this can be proved by using the exact solution. Assumption one is a bit tricky, but you can prove it by using result from the number theory. Okay, so I have two more slides and one summary. So I, I will tell you something about general theory in one slide and something about analysis of the free fermion chain, chain in one slide. Okay. Okay, so in general theory part, I want to uh, tell you how you prove that the effective is large. As I said, the effective is believed to be large in a realistic non-equilibrium state, but it's in general very hard to justify this. So uh, this is one way of justifying this. So this is our assumption, and uh, this is a notation by d left, I denote the dimension of this Hilbert space h left. 
And this is the initial state. Uh, this is a random normalized state from this H left. Now I consider this inner product absolute value to the power of four and take the average, average over random uh, states, okay? Random choice of phi zero. And since phi zero uh, is from this uh, H left, uh, you can just insert uh, this projection per operator here, right? And then uh, you want to take this random state average, but this is a very standard calculation. And there is a standard formula for random state average. And this is the exact form you get, okay? And here you get the dimension of this Hilbert space. And now uh, this part can be, of course, rewritten like this. Now uh, you want to consider this the effective inverse. And I want to take this uh, average over random phi zero. And then uh, from the definition, you get this. And now this, this thing, this average can be bounded like this. So I plug this in. And also I have this uh, phi p phi squared. So I just keep one of them as it is. And uh, I use this upper bound for one of them. So uh, two to the minus n. So for one of them, we have this two to the minus n and the other is here when we sum it over j. And now, uh, since this is traced, uh, this is exactly equal to d left, okay? And so uh, this cancel, this, this, and this cancel with each other, and you get this upper bound. So uh, here you have d left here, so it's very large, and you have two to the minus n, so you get something very small. And after a little bit of computation, you can show that this is as small as the total inverse times this thing. And this is again annoying part, and this may not be small if rho is large, but we are considering the case where rho is small, low density case. And then in this case, uh, this one is very small. And so you can say that this is almost the total inverse. And this shows you that the effective is almost as large as the total. Okay, so that's a one part, one discussion, essential discussion from the general theory. Uh, one very important discussion about from analysis of the free fermion chain is proof of the absence of degeneracy. So this is our n-body Hamiltonian. And if you know something about free fermion, you know that energy eigenvalues can be explicitly written like this, where this nj is our occupation numbers. So nj takes zero or one, and if it, they sum up to be m, the total particle number. Okay, so this is the exact elementary formula. And note that this same thing can be written like this. This is a real part e to the i theta and this sum. And here theta is this the, the lth root of one. And okay, so you, you, here you, you get sort of polynomial, integer coefficient polynomial of this theta. And if you know something about the number theory, you guess that this kind of object must be studied in the number theory. And so we consulted our number theory friend and we found, we learned that there is a very important lemma that we can use. Uh, the lemma said that, okay, so here L, we assume that L is an odd prime and N is less than uh, L over four and this M are M's are integer, okay? And then the first lemma says that if M is not zero for some J and then this sum, which is very similar to this one is non-zero. And this beautiful important lemma was proved by a very clever mathematician uh, probably you know, probably you know his name. Uh, he is called Gauss. Okay, and by using this uh, classical result of Gauss, you can prove rather easily that uh, this these energy eigenvalues are non-degenerate for uh, theta, for except for a finite values of theta. Okay, but uh, from from this, you can only say that uh, no degenerate for most theta, and you cannot pinpoint a concrete value of theta. In which, at which you can avoid degeneracy. And uh, for to pinpoint a value of theta, you have to, you need another lemma, uh, which says uh, that this is not only non-zero, but uh, it, it, it said that which this, this after value is at least uh, larger than this point. Okay. And by using this uh, number theoretic lemma, uh, this is not very straightforward, but you can prove that uh, our energy eigenvalues uh, free from degeneracy when theta is non-zero and satisfies this. Uh, so uh, sufficiently small, 
and smallness is guaranteed like here. And uh, this is a textbook lemma, but this uh, we didn't find this in you know textbook. So we have a proof in our paper. This is a proof. So actually, this proof makes use of the notion of uh, uh, field norm. Field doesn't mean the field theory in the physics, the field in algebra or algebraic integer and so on. So this is a very heavy, uh, this is a very elegant proof, but that makes use lot of use of notion from algebraic number theory. And of course, we like mathematics, but we, we are of course not able to uh, make write this kind of proof. And actually when we needed this kind of lower bound, bound I posted a question to Twitter uh, which is now called by a weird name. But anyway, I posted a question to Twitter. Then uh, two the mathematicians immediately, really immediately uh, gave an answer and proved this lower bound and they gave us this proof. That's wonderful. Okay, so uh, this is basically all I wanted to say in this short video. So let me go to summary. So we focus, oh, by the, by the way, this is Professor von Neumann when he did this uh, ETH work. So we focused on the problem of thermalization, uh, which means approach to thermal equilibrium in isolated macroscopic quantum systems. And without relying on, on any unproven assumptions, we proved that a free fermion chain exhibits thermalization. Okay? And the key observations were that a random non-equilibrium initial state has a large effective dimension and that the absence of degeneracy can be proved by using some number theoretic results. Okay, these were just only for free fermions, but uh, we had some general result. So it is desirable to have examples of non-integrable systems in which our plausible assumptions for the general theory of summarization can be justified. Okay, so that's all. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.